Hi everyone, I'm Wardy and welcome to Ask Wardy. We are talking about the best way to have your meat slaughtered, processed, butchered, it's lots of names to call it, but how do you get it to the table? It's packaged, it's aged, how is it handled? It's very important. So let's talk about that today. First, let me welcome you to Ask Wardy. This is the weekly show where I answer your questions about traditional cooking, and I'm thrilled you're here. If you're live on Facebook or Periscope, a big hello to you. And on Facebook, Millie is right there in the comments, pasting links and answering your questions. And I, of course, go back later and check them out. No matter what, AskWardy.tv has the transcript, the links, the notes, the recordings, everything that's happening here today. Just look for episode 84, okay? So here's the issue. Well, first, if you're live, paste in the comments what you're drinking, where you're from, and your first name. Love to hear that. I have boring old water today. I love going in there and seeing all the interesting different kefirs and kombuchas and broth, and you all are just great with your nourishment. All right, so here's the issue. We take great care to look for pastured meats, grass-fed meats. We talk to our farmer, we source these awesome meats. Did you know that it's equally important to pay attention to how those meats are processed? Meaning how the animal is slaughtered, to how the um, carcass is handled after the animal's death, to how it's cut up, to how it's packaged. It's all very important and if you don't do it carefully or don't put some time and thought into researching the best ways, then really great meat could actually end up mushy. It could end up with the worst texture because it's really important to pay attention to those details too. Also, just think about it. You source out grass-fed, pastured, and if the processing isn't so good, you could actually ruin really great meat by not being careful with processing. And the things we're gonna talk about today, they apply to whether you're outsourcing it, like going to a local butcher shop, um, or, or if you're doing it yourself or going in with friends and butchering. So these are, these are um, principles that apply no matter what avenue you're going. And this is actually a question that came from Natalie J recently. She says, Wardy, I love your stuff. So thanks for sharing with us. I appreciate that, Natalie. My question is about sourcing my meat. I am concerned with how the animal is slaughtered and processed. I have read that they can be humanely handled and fed, but what happens before and during the processing? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And Natalie, it's great that we're on the same page about sourcing quality meats, grass-fed, pastured. I do have a past, past Ask Wardy all about that. You can go to askwardy.tv and you can look for episode 73. It's where we go over the differences between grass-fed and conventionally raised meats. It's um, surprisingly, well, I think we're all on the same page, but just in case you're not sure, just in case families like, is that really a big deal? This will t make sure and ensure you that it's really a big deal. That was covered on another podcast. Today we're gonna talk about the processing. All right, everyone? So we've got a few things to, to, to uh, look for. One is a stress-free slaughter. Now, anybody seen the movie um, Temple Grandin uh, a few years back? A real lady, an autistic lady, who had a great affinity for cows. She loved them. And she noticed that in the food industry that um, the conditions that led them to slaughter were really bad for the cows. And she noticed they traveled in circles and she just was really intuitive about noticing these patterns that cows underwent. And, and she brought it to the attention of the ag and food industry to introduce humane slaughter practices. Uh, she cared about the cows, but the end result was really, really good for us um, because the meat turns out better when you practice humane slaughtering. And so nowadays, really, you can't, I, I'd say it's, you'd be hard pressed to find an animal that isn't humanely slaughtered. But if you're considering doing this on your own or hiring it out, and it's not part of this really huge facility, then you wanna pay attention to these details. And basically the importance is, bottom line here is, the animal shouldn't be panicked, stressed, excited at all. Um, when they're put down, it should be a complete surprise to them because excitement and stress can lead to poor quality meat. You could either get red, firm, dried out meat. You could either get pale, mushy, textured meat. And this all has to do with the texture and the hormones in the animal's body and the um, 
kind of the stress they're under. And really the different stresses cause different results in the meat. But if the animal is put down and it's in, its, in an environment where it's completely at peace, where it's happy, where the putting down is very humane and a surprise, so there's no stress put on the animal, um, the animal doesn't suffer and the meat end up, ends up great. So that's why it's really, really important to, to seek out stress-free slaughter. I have a past article at our site where we raised our first homegrown um, beef. It was our dairy cow who had a heifer and we raised the heifer uh, for beef. And um, we hired out, we hired a local um, mobile slaughter and they came out and they put her down right in the pasture. She didn't know it was coming, um, which is very humane because she was just at peace and it was the best meat we ever had. And so if you're putting down your own animals, you can do it yourself many ways. I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to put an animal down. Uh, but the important thing is that they're not under any kind of stress. So whether you do it yourself, you hire it out, or let's say you're purchasing a whole or a half beef from a farmer, they're probably engaging in these humane slaughter practices. It doesn't hurt to ask though. Just ask, what are the conditions under which the animal is put down? I want and say, I want to make sure that they're at peace and not stressed out at all. Uh, if some places um, the animal will be transferred from the farm to the slaughterhouse alive. And so what you wanna make sure in that case is that the animal has plenty of time to get familiar with the surroundings um, so that again, they're at peace when the time comes. So animals being moved is very stressful to them. They're, in that way, they're a lot like people, right? I mean, we get stressed out when we're in unfamiliar situations and so do the animals. So that's very, very important. And I think Natalie, we're already on the same page because you mentioned that, but it's really important to just lay the groundwork there, that the first thing you want to look for is a stress-free slaughter. Okay, um, there is a book, and there's a lot of information in here. Um, it's the complete book of butchering, smoking, curing, and sausage making. And there's a lot of information about the condition under which an animal is put down and kind of the effects in the body of stress and temperature and whatnot. I've just given you the bottom line, but if you're interested in detailed information, this is a great source. And we do have a link for you at askwardy.tv. This episode is 84, or if you're on Facebook, just look in the comments, okay? Um, the second thing you want to look for has to do with what happens after the animal is put down. Um, and I call it actually, it is called, it's not just me, uh, dry aging. How is the animal aged? There's dry aging, there's wet aging, there's no aging at all, okay? And we are so fortunate, we live within an hour now in Indiana of a fantastic uh, processing house. It's this old farm, and if any of you are in this area or Illinois, you may have heard of this old farm. Um, they have a great description of our preference for um, the aging of meat called dry aging. So I'm just gonna read you a bit from their uh, website on why it's superior. After slaughter, carcasses are split down the spinal column, washed down, tagged with all necessary information needed for 100% traceability, and then put in the cooler to dry age. Beef is typically dry aged for six to 14 days after slaughter, four to seven days for pork, lamb, and goat. Dry aging, and this is the important part, dry aging is an important factor in getting the best quality of meat. During this process, enzymes in the meat change the muscle fibers, which makes the meat more tender, increases the quality of taste, and adds to the meat's juiciness. Most meat bought in the U.S. is not aged at all, or it's sometimes wet aged for a short time. And wet aging means that the primal cuts, chuck, rib, loin, or round, are wrapped in plastic and stored at cold above freezing temperatures. At, at this old farm, um, and there's many locations um, around the country that practice this old-fashioned method of dry aging, this old farm, which is in Indiana, Colfax, Indiana, all our beef, pork, and lamb are hung in our coolers at 34 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit for optimal results. After dry aging, the meat is cut and packaged to order. So that's what dry aging is, and that's why it's superior. It's time for the meat to increase tenderness, increase juiciness, increase flavor. 
oh, it's to die for when you're able to do this. And we seek it out every time. We make sure, I always ask, if we change a farm or change a beef source where we're purchasing a whole, or if we have our own that we're taking in, I always say, how long do you dry age it? And I love it when I can get 21 days. <laughs> the minimum really you wanna look for is seven days. A lot of places will do 14. And if they're not super busy, um, they may give you more time to 21 days, okay? So dry aging is really, really desirable to pursue because of the flavor and the tenderness of your meat. Um, during this time, the conditions need to be sanitary. So, you know, USDA inspected facilities, um, the air needs to circulate entirely around the carcass and the temperatures need to be below 40 degrees for the aging time, but not freezing. Okay, and that's basically how it works. So whether you're seeking out a butcher to do a quarter, whole, or half beef, or other animal, or sheep, lamb, or goat, or pork, um, look for dry aging. It's incredibly worth it for the end result. All right, let's move on to number three now, which is the packaging. Packaging, I have an example here of a really nice beef sirloin steak. <laughs> um, you know, we've purchased from various, or we've had various animals processed from different butchers. And the first time we did it, it was wrapped in a couple layers of freezer paper. The next, and then the next time we got some in freezer paper, and we got some in those like plastic tubes, like the ground beef that comes in those plastic tubes. And um, recently, since we've switched, since we've moved here and we've been at this old farm, we get these amazing BPA free, um, BPS free vacuum seal packages. Your meat simply does not freezer burn in these like it does in the paper or those just ordinary plastic tubes. So I highly, highly prefer if you have the option to do this vacuum seal packaging. Um, like I said, your meat is gonna last a long time in the freezer and it doesn't freezer burn. The exception is if this gets punctured. If it gets punctured, then it's not safe from freezer burn. And what I do, in, in, invariably, we might puncture some during travel or transport or switching, or it might come from the processor. Rarely it comes punctured already. And we just eat those first. Just when you're, you can tell because it's not tight to it. Um, and so you just eat those first. And the ones that are vacuum sealed, you, you can keep in the freezer for quite a long time. Um, and they stay good. Vacuum sealing is really superior, a superior packaging method. So look for that if you can. Again, it's not as important as the uh, stress-free slaughter and the dry aging, uh, but if you can do it, it's worth it. And the fourth thing I wanna go over here is mechanical tenderizing. Um, if, this often comes up when you're talking about pastured meats. Um, it's not a rule that pastured meats are tough, but a lot of times they're leaner, a lot of times the animals have had a lot more exercise, and so your, um, your end result can be tougher. And some of it I think is by design. It's just the nature of the animal getting more exercise and being leaner. And it's also, as a culture, we're so used to factory farmed meat that's juicy and tender because the animals have had no exercise. Um, so we have to adjust to that. But the butcher is often gonna ask you, do you want your so-and-so cut tenderized and it's a mechanical tenderizing it's you know that tenderizing mallet that you can actually do in your kitchen well it's a machine they have in there that can just take cuts and cut into your meat and mechanically tenderize it so that then when you thought use it in your kitchen it's kind of pre-tenderized if that makes sense well the issue with that um, is it's not really desirable and here's the reason and i'm going to give you a quote from alder spring ranch in idaho and alder spring ranch um, it's this remote location in, I in idaho where very few people have trod the soils have really not been used other than to graze and so they're mineral rich nutrient dense and alder spring ranch grows grass-fed organic beef on this pristine land in idaho it's really marvelous and they recommend against mechanical tenderizing, and here's why. This is a quote from Glenn, the owner. This is more common than most people realize and involves stabbing the meat with narrow razors to tenderize it before packaging. We believe this introduces pathogens from the outside of the meat to the inside and should not be needed if beef is produced correctly. Our growing and processing protocols are what make Alder Spring beef tender, not mechanical tenderizing. 
So this is really the reason that we, as a family, turn down mechanical tenderizing um, when we have a whole beef or other meat processed. And I know someone might ask this, so I'm gonna cover it right now, because a common question is, well, I'm buying a whole beef or I'm buying a half beef, I've never done it before, what kind of cuts should I get? Well, if it's a steak or a roast that are known to be super tender, you can ask your butcher, what are the most tender roasts? What are the most tender steaks? We keep those as is. We get those steaks, we get those roasts. If it's anything that's known to be like medium tender or actually tough most of the time, we get those ground into ground beef along with all the rest of the ground beef. That's what we do. So that's another reason we don't have a need for mechanical tenderizing because the choicest cuts, the tenderest cuts, like your filet mignon and your sirloin steaks, um, your rib steaks, those are all so tender as is, you don't need mechanical tenderizing. And the other things that might end up tough, we put into ground, if that makes sense. All right, so those four things that we've discussed is really gonna help you ensure that your processing is the healthiest healthiest for the animal, but also you're going to end up with the healthiest meat for your family to consume, and it's really going to be the best tasting and the best textured. So a stress-free slaughter, dry aging for, if you can get it to 21 days on beef, do. Uh, pork and the others, seven days. Oh, and by the way, chicken doesn't dry age. Uh, third would be the packaging. So if you can get uh, freezer burn-free vacuum seal packaging, do that. And fourth is say no to the mechanical tenderizing. So we have come to the end here. I just wanna say that you might find a hurdle if you are trying to source this in your area and you might run into, well, I don't have a processor that does those old fashioned things like you're talking about or um, some other hurdle like that or it's too far. So I highly recommend Alder Spring Ranch in Idaho tradcookschool.com slash Alder Spring. There's also a link with this video. You can check them out, they ship um, all over the place, all over the country. They're so remote, remote that Glenn has told me that he considers the rest of the country their local area because they're so remote even to people that live out there. But they have excellent beef if you can't find anything locally that meets these standards. Let me just invite all of you who may be new to check out our free traditional cooking video series. That's at tradcookschool.com slash free vids. Free vids is all one word, or there's a link with this video. In that series, I introduce you to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the fundamental techniques of traditional cooking. So soaking and sprouting, or if you're getting really good quality meat, like we're talking about today, one of the videos is an exciting skillet dish formula where you use the things that you already have in your kitchen and you can create diverse and wonderful dishes for your families in a skillet. So that's a fun video. So check that out if you haven't already signed up for it. I welcome you to do that. And if you want to bookmark, share, or refer to anything I've mentioned here today, it's all ready for you at askwardy.tv. Look for episode 84. And if you'd like to submit a question for a future episode, you can do that following the instructions there at the episode show notes too. Thanks everyone so much for joining me. God bless you. Bye-bye.